Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of Show Me the Crypto. This episode is brought to you by Ballet, making crypto easy. And it was a great conversation. Our interview is with Cooper Turley, and it's his third time on the podcast. Only one other guest has been on Show Me the Crypto three times. But there's a reason we keep bringing Cooper back, because he knows where things are at in this space. Alf, what was your biggest takeaway from the conversation? Honestly, it's Coop's knowledge around on-chain music and everything he's doing at Coop Records to bring musicians on-chain. We really dove into what that means, how the landscape is today and how it's changed since even just a couple of years ago. You know, everything moves so fast in the space and on-chain music is no exception. But beyond that, I mean, we, we dive, dove into on-chain social as well, uh, which I feel like is something that's been attempted at for so long, but it's finally taking off in many ways and uh, really getting into Farcaster, Dracula, these other on-chain social apps uh, was a great part of the conversation for me. 100%. Super interesting. I mean, let's face it. We had Cooper on the podcast back in 2021. He taught us what an NFT was back then. And seeing how far the space has evolved is really interesting. He also talked about the bull run and what are some trends to keep an eye on. He had some bold predictions, some hot takes. You're going to really enjoy this episode of Show Me the Crypto. Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto! <laughs> Show me the crypto! In a world on the brink of disruption, two men will bring you clarity by interviewing some of the most intelligent and influential names in the blockchain world. Welcome to Show Me the Crypto with your hosts, Wade Patterson and Ulf Lonegren. Well, hi there, and welcome to Show Me the Crypto, brought to you by Ballet, making crypto easy. My name is Wade Patterson. And I'm Alf Lonegren. We're a couple of friends from Canada who love learning about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, and we're happy you're along for the ride. Whether you're a crypto virgin or you know your way around the block, we hope our interviews with some of the most intelligent and influential people in the blockchain space help deliver you with value. And on this episode, we're joined by returning guest and friend of the podcast, Cooper Turley. Cooper is the founder of Coop Records, which is a hybrid between a Web3 venture fund, a record label, and an incubator. Cooper is focused on revolutionizing the music industry by bringing artists on chain and empowering them to keep control and ownership of their work. His bio currently reads on chain is the new online. Cooper, welcome back for a third time to show me the crypto. Stoked to be here, guys. It's amazing to see all of the progress that's happened over the last few years. And I feel like every time we chat, it's about something new and exciting. So I'm honored to be back on the podcast. We're really excited about this conversation. And where it got started is I came across a tweet that you put out earlier this month. And I'm going to unpack it a little bit. I won't read it verbatim. But basically, what you said is that a lot has changed in the last year. What you were excited about wasn't really exciting to others. You went too hard on the music NFT meme, but now you're in a happier place. You're putting more music on chain than ever before. And you have lots to lots of thoughts to share about where everything is at. So we're hoping this episode to dive into some of those thoughts. But where I'm hoping to start is with the question, are music NFTs dead? Music NFTs have been dead for a long time. And so it's building it from the ground up. And what I mean by that is when that meme started, I think it was really the peak of the bull market, right? It was the idea that you could buy a limited edition of a song for $100 and then sell it for $1,000. And I think what we've seen now is that the notion of NFT as we once knew it is completely gone. I think that when I think of that word, I think about PFPs, board apes, you know, highly scarce, highly limited assets that have super high floor prices. People are making a ton of money trading them gone. I think that word is cursed. I think that people are really intimidated by it. And so although what we're doing on the record label is putting music on chain and selling them as NFTs, we really stray away from that language. We find that it's really polarizing to people. And so what it looks like today is that the idea of speculation has largely left the building. I think that now it's a lot more about buying things that are fun and social to collect to share with your friends. And our role as the record label is really to make this space feel inviting and accommodating to artists who have never touched it before. So to answer the question directly, music NFTs, we once knew them 100% dead, but music NFTs walked so that on-chain music could run. 
This episode of Show Me the Crypto is brought to you by Ballet, making crypto easy. The Ballet Real Series is a cold storage that will make your life easier. Forget about the complexities of crypto forever. That's right. The Ballet Real Series cold storage wallet is designed to be user friendly, secure and hassle free. Essentially, if you are new to crypto, this is the product for you. The unique non-electronic design requires no updates and removes all hassles and software related risks. Experience and grow your crypto with ease. And Ballet recently launched their physical Bitcoin product, which is a copper coin, which is a physical bearer of real on-chain Bitcoin. This particular coin comes in the 0.001 Bitcoin denomination, and it's perfect for gifting to your non-crypto savvy friends or even for storage for yourself. If you want storage in a physical sense, it's available in 25 states and jurisdictions. All of the information is linked in the show notes below. Now back to the episode. Nice. And it was only shortly after our last interview that you launched Coop Records. So you know, what was the original inspiration behind Coop Records and how maybe has, you know, knowing that even music NFTs as we knew them are dead and have, you know, now they've got this new beginning. How has Coop Records evolved since the time when you launched? It's a great question, man. I mean, I've been uh, collecting music on chain for the better half of like two or three years at this point. And so I don't know how deep into the backstory I want to go. I'll let you guys kind of lead that after I respond to this one here. But Coop Records was really just a beacon for me to take the work I was doing as an individual collector, you know, someone that was buying a lot of work on chain, someone that was doing angel investments into these companies, someone that was working with founders on building product and onboarding artists and kind of taking that in house, you know, I think that at a certain point, I realized that I just understood the pain points that these artists were going through when it came to learning how to use crypto. I understood the pain points as a collector because I was a collector myself. And I just found myself in this kind of situation where I was like, hey, I'm extremely passionate about music. I'm extremely passionate about crypto. Music people hate crypto and crypto people hate music. And so we need something in between. And that thing in between was Coop Records. And since then, we've been operating as an on-chain record label, onboarding about five to 10 songs a week. We've worked with about 70 artists, have done about 300 songs at this point. And so we really found a great system that's working with artists who have never touched crypto before and with crypto people who have never heard of these artists before. And so Really, it's just a, a labor of love building it each and every day here. So what's your approach then? You talk to artists who aren't maybe crypto savvy. How do you pitch them on bringing their music on chain? I go to them and I say, hey, I love this song. I've been following your work for a long time, which I genuinely have been. I'm a big fan of the artists that we work with. And I say, hey, um, I have this new space over here that's right for you to be able to monetize your music in a new way. You know, I don't have any expectation of you talking about this space. We know it's super intimidating. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a wallet for you. We're going to start a group chat and you're just going to send us a song and a cover art. We're going to upload that song to sound for you. We're going to make you a frame on Warpcast. We're going to set up some boost campaigns on Boost and Layer 3. And so we handle all of the distribution. At the end of the day, what the artist is providing is great music and an opportunity to be able to leverage their brand in a new space. And on their end, they just wake up and they have ETH in a wallet that didn't exist before. So it's very mutually beneficial. And I think the structure we're using of these unlimited open editions have been really empowering because there's no longer this idea of speculation. There's no longer this merit of utility that you're expecting to get a FaceTime with the artist or backstage tickets to a show. It just feels like the playing field has been really leveled out. And there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's really you know resonated with artists that we're working with and something that we're really excited about. Even with all that white glove service, is there still some hesitation among some people who maybe had bad or negative connotations about the industry in the past? Or have most people you communicated with been willing to give it a go? Uh, pretty much everyone's been willing to give it a go. And that's because we just position it as like, let's try this out. You know, let's just do one song. And if you don't like it, no pressure. But I would mm -hmm. say that basically every artist we've worked with has been down to just continually release new records with us. You know, the flow that we have is we have a group chat. And so if a song's coming out on Spotify, I'll just see it being marketed across like TikTok and Instagram leading up to release. And I'll just say, hey guys, would love to get this up on sound the same day. They send over the assets, we handle the upload, we send them some updates like, hey, this song's number two, it's number three on the charts and whatnot. And uh, it's a really amazing flow. And I would say to your question about hesitation, there is some initial reservation at the beginning because they don't want to be able, they don't want to talk about this to their fans. They don't want to tell their regular music fans to get into crypto because there's a huge negative connotation. 
they are initially intimidated about having to make a wallet and having to like use ETH and do bridging and all this stuff. And so I think for us to be able to come to them and just addressing the pain points that they have head on without them having to say it to us, it just really feels like we're meeting them where they're at mentally and they're much more willing to kind of take a shot with it. And I'd say that now we have a big enough catalog of established artists where we say, hey, here's all the releases we've done so far that they're like, oh, if all those other artists were willing to do it, then I'm down to do it too. I think this goes back to the point around music NFTs as we know them being dead. But, you know, at one point, minting music NFT is, while it was never maybe, you know, the price of some of those expensive, well-known PFP type NFTs, it was still, you know, decently high if you're comparing it to, say, going out and, and buying a record in physical form or, you know, something like that, or just buying a song online for, for a buck or whatever. Um, and so since then, we've seen the cost of minting it predominantly, like significantly drop. Is that a good thing? Like, is that good or bad? Why has that happened? And how do you think it will still potentially evolve? Or are we where we are, you know, for as far as like how music NFTs and artists are going to put their music on chain? It's a hot take, but I've been a huge fan of the progression around the minting format that exists today. And I think it's going to become cheaper. I think right now mm -hmm. on these platforms like Sound, Zora, you name it, you have a free mint and under the hood, they're charging you 0. 0.000777 ETH. And so on a good day, it's about $3. Where I have an issue with that is $3 is not free. And most of the world, you spending $3 on something is a big deal. And so where I want to get to is a world where we're closer to $1 mint prices. And what you get for that $1 is extremely clear because you're getting what you would get in the traditional world, which is a download of a song, the ability to leave a comment, and the ability to build some reputation with the artist. And so I think initially there was a lot of negative sentiment around like, oh, we're devaluing the cost of music. You know, one of ones used to be one ETH, you know, limited editions used to be 0.1. Now they're only a couple of dollars. But the way I see it, man, is like the name of the game now is distribution. It's trying to get this music into as many wallets as possible. And as long as we have a mint price that is a barrier to entry for people that are living in third world countries and other parts of the world, we're not going to be able to effectively scale the space. So my sort of North Star is a dollar to mint. You get something very tangible with it. You don't worry about speculation. And for those very special records that do end up going viral in the real world or something like that, we try and find a form factor that's more suitable for those kind of viral moments instead of assuming that every single song that exists is going to have a 10 ETH floor price, which is just never going to happen no matter how you spin it. Cooper, one of the things about our podcast, as you know, is, is we're always trying to take these kind of complex ideas and make them really simple to understand, even for people who aren't in the crypto space. And so I'm, I'm curious if somebody's listening to this or watching it and they're thinking, why would I mint, right? Why mint versus stream or download a piece of content? What's your answer to that? My answer would be a uh, hop on Warpcast and join a cool community of people that are collecting things every day. You know, I'm not going to try and convince you to collect a song because of some technological reason or for some utility it's going to give you. Um, it's because it's cool and it's fun to do and people you know are doing it too. And I think it's been really, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of peace out of the fact that we're selling this music to crypto people. You know, as much as I do wish that there's going to be a world where an average fan of an artist is going to want to come and collect this song on chain, it's not the case and it probably won't be for a very long time. And so where I kind of sit now is saying, hey, I have this community I've developed on Warpcast. I've been in crypto for a long time. I'd like to say I have a pretty good compass on what's popular in the music world. Let me bring that music to my friends who have been on chain for a very long time. Because when you ask someone in crypto, why would I mint something? They're already doing this hundreds of times a month. They're going on Zora, they're collecting things, they're collecting their friends' works when they're minting a picture, a photo, or whatever it might be, a podcast, et cetera. And so I think that where we're evolving as a space is recognizing that minting is a very social experience and you don't need to get something out of it to have a good time. If you're just minting to support something you like or to support a friend or to be a part of a community, that's a win to me. And I think that's the way that we've positioned it to the people that collect our music today. That might answer this next question already. But I'm curious about, you know, like you see stability, you have the ability to do multiple mints of the same, you know, the, the same piece of content. 
why would someone do that? Is there any benefits to to minting something multiple times? Or is it like you just said, it's about, you know, supporting and just like that intrinsic desire to maybe own multiple copies of something? Right now, I think it's about status. Like you just stand out more in the audience if you collect multiple editions of it. Where I want to go with this is that there's a huge evolving world around like the incentivization of mints. So for example, on a platform like Boost or Layer 3, you collect this song on sound for $3. I give you back $1.50 of these tokens. That token can be OP tokens. It could be a meme coin like DGEN or like higher, et cetera. Where I want to get to is a world where you collecting a song gets you ownership in what we're building as a record label, so Coop Records, or it gets you ownership in that artist and their representation of their on-chain identity. So imagine that your favorite artist is releasing songs on sound or some other platform, and you're able to earn artist tokens as a reward for doing that. Now, the reason that you would collect multiple editions is probably not because that song is going to go 100x and go crazy, but A, you're building reputation that like this is the song you really stand behind, and you're probably earning a higher stake of tokens because you're spending more money on that artist economy. And I think the way I see this evolving is I'm really into this idea of on-chain points. I'm really into this idea of on-chain reputation and on-chain loyalty. And I think if we can create systems where you are earning higher stakes of ownership in these communities by virtue of the amount that you spend in them, I think it starts to create a really exciting funnel for people to want to hang out and keep continuing to collect. You had mentioned mentioned Warpcast there, and I know that a big focus of yours, you tweeted about it, is the fact that you know you've focused on building your on chain audience. You already have a massive Twitter following. I mean, it's over 150k, but you've surpassed that in the on chain mm-hmm. audience. So, why was that a focus for you? Uh, Twitter just got really washed, and I feel like I just didn't really have much to say, and I wasn't resonating with people, and people didn't like to hear what I have to say. And a lot of that was my own psychological, you know, hurdle mm-hmm. that I had to get over. But I feel like I just kind of lost my voice and my position in the space. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that it was a bear market and everyone was kind of trying to figure out what the next thing was. But I also feel like I just shifted from, you know, more of like an influencer advocate type of person who was talking about tokens and like what's going up and why the market was hot to like wanting to get in the trenches and building product and like really understanding the pain points of why the space wasn't scaling. And so Farcaster became an outlet for me to do that. Like I could go on Farcaster and be like, yo, crypto onboarding sucks. Like people don't want to write down a seed phrase. Bridging is terrible. Like we're pretending that the world is able to come on chain now because we're on a layer two, but like signing up for Coinbase sucks and like getting your first ETH sucks. And I was able to say these things on Farcaster and have them really well received as opposed to Twitter, where I largely just felt like, and I still feel this way, Twitter is basically a spot for you to talk about ways to make money and ways to communicate what is making other people money. And with Farcaster, I felt like this is a space for me to just be able to talk about what I'm building and the space as a whole. And I think being early to Farcaster, I was able to find a really tight niche group of builders who are building products on top of base, You know, really just evangelizing the kind of consumer crypto ecosystem and, you know, for all intents and purposes, has become the home base for where we're building Coop Records and really all the other brands that we're establishing in the on-chain music economy. I'm really interested in the the whole on-chain social concept, just because that's how my entry to the space came back in 2016, an old chain named Steemit, which eventually evolved oh, into yeah. Hive, which was all about putting your content on chain, but it was more a focus on the rewards that you would get. And then people would cash those out and that kind of thing. So the system didn't work. That's why we don't see a lot of people on that chain today. What do you think kind of the future of on chain is? Because it was interesting earlier in the conversation, you were saying, you know, you're at, at peace with the fact that this is a very crypto native audience, and it will be for a long time. But do you think that there will be a turning point where the masses come to on chain social? Yeah, I just don't think they'll know that they are coming to on-chain social. I think it'll just be like a superior product experience, you know? And I think that um, to answer your question about like what it looks like relative to something like Steemit, part of the reason why I got so into Farcaster is that tipping became very prominent with this token called DGEN. And so just to like zoom in for a second here, on Farcaster, you got a daily allowance for being an active user of Farcaster. Since Farcaster's social graph is on-chain, you could basically track what my engagement was, how many followers I'm getting, how actively I'm posting, who I'm interacting with. And the DGEN project used that as a social graph to give you a daily allowance. Now that daily allowance was my ability to give tokens to people that weren't coming out of my own pocket. And I think this is really important to zoom in on here because tipping has existed for a long time in crypto. But what DGEN did is they said, hey, 
because you're very active on Farcaster, we're going to give you an allowance of 100K tokens per day to give to people. Now, what I could do is simply just say, you know, great, great cast, here's a thousand DGEN. And because it's an on-chain social platform, they were actually accruing a balance that was claimable at the end of a cycle. And so you had all of these people that were on Farcaster giving out tokens and this net new distribution mechanism without having to give it out of their own pocket that ended up becoming super valuable. You know, a lot of people that were really active in that early DGEN community ended up making crazy amounts of money from those first early seasons. And I think that's just like the tip of the iceberg for what's unlocked by these on-chain social experiences. You know, I could go into the whole conversation around like your followers are going to stick with you from Warpcast to Dracula to Sonata to all these other products. But at its core, I just really think it's about making the ability to do things on-chain a lot more seamless and not need to leave the social platform you're on to perform on-chain actions. And I think that's what it currently looks like today. And I'm optimistic that in the future, if those actions become desirable, that is the thing that's going to actually get real people to start using this because it just offers a superior social experience to what exists today. How do you think that that... Because I I haven't really experimented at all with, with Farcaster, but I'm just curious, one of the biggest problems Steemit Hive had was these not being genuine interactions. People were gaming the system. It kind of became a circle jerk of content in terms of people getting each other's upvotes. So how did, I mean, from somebody like your perspective, how were you ensuring that you were kind of spreading out those tips and in general that the content and the interactions were genuine? I don't think it was like a conscious effort for me. I think that, you know, as I mentioned before, I was probably on Farcaster for about three or four months before DGen even launched. And so at that point, I kind of knew like who was legit on the platform. Like there was a lot of founders, builders, investors, artists, etc. that were just really active in the community. And so I mean, for me, it's just basically like imagine that you're on Twitter and you could just give someone $5 when you like a tweet of theirs, but it doesn't come out of your pocket. And I feel like that social relationship was so powerful to me that that combined with the introduction of frames and some of these other things that Farcaster built, I just really saw like a very clear future. I was like, oh, this is where I want to build my audience this cycle because I feel confident that at some point this will become a shelling point for new people to get into the space. Now, how we get there, I think I am unclear of. To your point, there definitely is a lot of like spam and people just trying to like farm tips and whatnot. But overall, I feel like the relationship with the platform is far more quality than it is like spam and negative content. But I think that's really a challenge for any social platform that's going through like a growth cycle is how do you actually keep the conversation good and consistent and something that I feel very confident that the Farcaster team will figure out over time. For those who haven't used Farcaster, what would you say the main benefits are to coming over there versus something traditional like Twitter? And is the audience there, you know, we've talked about audience being more crypto native, but is Farcaster a great fit for anyone who wants to see success on a social channel like Twitter? Or is it best suited for those who are, you know, doing things on chain and are, you know, actively involved in the crypto community. It definitely favors people who are active in the crypto community. I mean, you look at the people who are on there and it's people that have been in crypto for a long time. But what I will say is that the vibe on Farcaster as someone who's new to crypto is a lot more friendly and inviting than the vibe that currently exists on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you just get into crypto through Twitter, the algorithm is going to push you towards Solana meme coins, celebrity tokens, you know, really fast money, people shouting at each other, like throwing around crazy words and whatnot. And Farcaster is going to be like, hey, this is what I built today. You know, I'm a founder and here's what I ship with my product. Or, hey, we have like a run club that's going on right now. Or like we're doing a meetup or something like that. And so one of the biggest gripes that Farcaster gets is that there's not a lot of like trading talk on there. There's not a lot of like, oh, I found this token early and it's going to go up a thousand X. But the benefit of that is that the conversation is a lot more inviting and welcoming. And I've onboarded, you know, a bunch of my friends to the platform, a bunch of artists to the platform. And they're just like, oh, I just like it here because I feel like I'm in this like net new pocket of the internet that feels like a secret in a lot of ways. Not a lot of people really know about it, but it's very accommodating to people of all shapes and sizes. So I'd say, yeah, if you haven't dove in, I'd recommend it. You know, I'm not going to say it's going to change your life or anything like that, but it's definitely been a very uh, great place for me to really rebuild my voice and somewhere that I feel very excited about welcoming new people in in the future. So Cooper, you had mentioned base earlier in the conversation. And one of the things I know you had had Jesse Pollack on the Cooper Records podcast talking to him about on-chain summer. And I know that you have a bit of an involvement in that with Midnight Diner. Can you talk a little bit about 
first off, for those who don't know, what is on chain summer? And then what is your particular contribution with Midnight Diner? Sure. So on chain summer to me is just a summer of drops celebrating base. You know, it's just ways to bring the world on chain. It's cool and exciting cultural projects. It's meant to be for people who are not into crypto. It's, you know, partnerships with big brands as well as on chain brands. And honestly, just a way to celebrate all the progress that's been made on base and layer twos in general. Our particular contribution to that is the Midnight Diner All Access Pass. So I live here in LA, we run a record label, and the best way to put people onto our music is to throw events. And so what we're doing with OnChain Summer is we're hosting three events here in LA, first week of every month. We have a warehouse in Koreatown. We bring out an artist that's dropping with us on the record label, and anyone who purchases the Midnight Diner Pass is able to come to those events for free. I kind of see this as like our way of sort of evangelizing what we're doing with the music on chain with something that's a lot more tangible. And more broadly, I would say that we are really excited about Base because it just feels very inviting to the world at large. We love working with the Base team. They've been a partner of ours for events in the past. And so I think it only felt natural that Midnight Diner was really our continuation of that sort of like IRL event series, but presented through the lens of on-chain summer and bringing more people into this world. Is there anything in particular with on-chain summer that has you excited outside of what you're doing with Midnight Diner? I'll be really honest with you that uh, on-chain summer this year is in a very interesting spot. You know, last year when on-chain summer launched, base was brand new. And so you saw FWB go live with the drop and make like 75 ETH off their NFT in the first like 24 hours. And I think that a lot of the early activity on on-chain summer last year was around like the excitement of base being a new chain, you know, obviously people speculating on a potential token, et cetera. I think this year it's in a much different place where the numbers aren't as big as they were last year but the quality of the projects is a lot better. And I think the challenge here is that crypto people want to spend time where they believe there is positive EV, where there's an airdrop to be gained or where there's money to be made. Historically, with on-chain summer this year, you're not going to be making a lot of money if you collect on-chain summer things. Like you're doing these activities that are fun and inviting, but it's not like you're going to buy the Midnight Diner Pass and it's going to go up 100x. And so I think they're kind of in this interesting spot where they're trying to cater for the attention of new people to join the space with their new smart wallet, but also trying to juggle like existing crypto consumer demand. And it's a very tricky middle ground. So to answer your question directly about like what I'm excited about, I would just say some of the core pieces of infrastructure, like the Coinbase smart wallet that just launched is very awesome. They have a new NFT marketplace that they're rolling out, which I'm very optimistic about. And if you go to uh, a partner named Layer 3, they have all the quests on there that you can complete for all of the different mints that are happening. And while none of them will make you money, I think it's a very good representation of a new generation of products and creators that are starting to build within these new ecosystems. And I think it gives you a very good taste of like what it means to be on-chain in 2024 that I feel is very foundational to the way in which I hope that people are going to come into the space in the future. One of the things we've talked about a while ago mm-hmm. on the podcast is the idea of, you know, podcast NFTs, but we see now pods.media is kind of picking up. I know Coop Records podcast, you that's where you're hosting your podcast themselves. What's interesting is um when you look through some of the podcasts that are, that are there, maybe some of the traditional ones that have been very successful, so something like uh Unchained, it's has a big listenership or big audience outside, but then on pods.media, very low amount of mints compared to like yours or some of the other ones, the mint podcast, for example. Why do you think that is that, you know, these ones that are popular in the traditional sense haven't really caught wind with the popularity of people wanting to mint those episodes? First of all, shout out pods.media. Absolutely love working with them. I actually mentioned to uh, the founder today that we should mint this podcast on pods. So fingers crossed, would love to be (laughs) able to collect it. To answer your question, the reality is that people like me and Adam are putting a significant amount of time and energy into maximizing our on-chain distribution. Hmm. What I mean by that is that we are running Boost on platform like Boost XYZ. We're running Quest on platforms like Layer 3, campaigns on platforms like Coinvise. We're launching frames on Warpcast. We're giving DGen tips away for collecting the content. We are leaning into the fact that we want people to collect this content. If you look at a podcast like Unchained, the content's phenomenal. You know, the host is super well respected. The guests are super popular and really big names in the space, but people aren't going to want to collect something unless you think that it's worth collecting yourself. And so for a host like me, I care a lot about maximizing our distribution, not only as a way to get people to listen to the podcast, but as a way of generating revenue. 
I think the best part about this whole emerging on-chain media playbook is that the more people you get to mint your podcast, the more money you make as a creator. And the more people that mint your podcast, the more people that are probably going to listen to it. You know, there's absolutely no correlation between like, I collect your podcast and I'm listening through all 60 minutes of it. In reality, I would say like five or 10% of collectors are like actually listening to the episode. But the way I see it is we're in a new age of media distribution. And in the same way that people are running marketing campaigns or Facebook ads in the traditional world, we now have that with the admin of platforms like Boost and Layer 3 and Coinvise and creators like me and Adam are going super ham on that. And I think that's why you're seeing the podcast mint numbers the way that they are today. Speaking of revenue, I'm just curious too, I meant to ask this earlier in the conversation, but Coop Records itself, how do you make money? We do 50-50 splits with our artists. And so if you mint a song on sound and it costs $2.50 to collect, Coop Records gets about 125 of that. And then the artist gets about 125 of that. And same as a uh, podcast splits 50-50 with the guests that we have on it. But high level, it's basically like, yeah, every mint we get, we make some margin on it. And we use that margin to maximize distribution through the ad campaigns. But high level, it's like we're just putting our budget back into reinvesting in the success of these mints. Artists is getting paid out. They don't touch you know, the marketing campaigns. They don't have to worry about recruitment or any of these crazy things. They just wake up and they see that they're on top of the charts. We're 50-50 partners on it. And it's a win-win situation. Now, what I'll say there, and I know you have a follow-up question, but we started out the record label as a 10% model. And so we were doing 10% on our releases. And because that's... We thought we were a distributor. We just thought, hey, if we're making a wallet for you and uploading this to sound, that's a distribution service. What we quickly realized is that if we just put a song on sound and it's the exact same thing as the Unchained podcast, people aren't going to mint it just because it exists there. You know, Maybe you'll get one, three, five mints because like someone stumbles across it. But... The reality is people don't want to collect these things just because they exist. Like you have to give them a reason to want to collect. And so I think what we realized is, hey, we can get mints using partners like Boost and Layer 3. We're now acting more like a label than we are a distributor. The difference being that a label provides capital and they provide distribution. And so outside of the service of just actually uploading the content, now we're running a marketing campaign. Now we're actually getting you mints that you would never get before. And so about two months ago, we switched to that 50-50 model. And it's been a huge game changer for our business and something that I think has allowed us to really upscale our business as a whole and work with a lot more artists. I'm curious about NFTs uh, You know, in the bigger picture. We've been really focused in on primarily audio music type NFTs in this conversation. But going to the bigger picture and talking more about just collecting NFTs and what that really means and why someone would do it and more so what they would pay for it. You know, we're seeing right now, uh, for example, Board Ape Yacht Clubs down to, I think, 8.8 crazy, you know, uh, floor price right now, which is just crazy to see such a dramatic fall from their all time highs. And it's been, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but they are big, you know, decreases in value when they happen. And it's been somewhat consistent over the last year or however long it's been. And my question here is, is the landscape of NFTs as a whole changing, not just you know what we were discussing around music NFTs earlier, but are people just seeing these as not... They don't have that value, that collector, that speculative value that we once thought they did when it was just a hype. And further to that question, how do you think... Will that change in the future? Will we see the highs that we used to see for, say those big blue chip NFT PFP no. projects? No, no. <laughs> well, go into that for me. NFTs are cooked, man. I mean, the reality is that we live in an attention economy and people want to trade meme coins. They don't want to trade NFTs. You saw the exact same thing with DeFi and the rotation to NFTs in 2021. We're like, I hold all these DeFi tokens in 2019, 2020. And when I started buying CryptoPunks, my friends were roasting me. They're like, why would you sell this like blue chip DeFi token for a pixelated JPEG, like that thing's never going to have value. And then CryptoPunks go crazy and everyone starts dumping their DeFi tokens. It's the exact same thing now with NFTs versus meme coins. Like why would you hold a board eight for eight ETH when you can buy eight ETH worth of like an emerging meme coin that people are really excited about and see a hundred X return on that. And so I think that the reality is volume just follows attention. 
I think that people got really burned out on the PFP meta. I don't think that the projects could live up to the value that these collections were priced at. And I think in general, NFTs just became super polarizing. And so I think when new people came into the space, they don't look at a board ape and start to go like, oh, wow, you're super legit because you have a board ape. They look at you and they're like, that's a meme. Like you're like, I call it old guard with my friends, but I'm like, yo, like people see board apes and these other PFPs and they're like, oh, that's a crypto dude. And that's like funny because this dude's into digital JPEGs, you know? But then I have friends where I'll go playing basketball and some dude's wearing like a hat and I'm like, oh, hat stays on. And he's like, oh, you're, you're into whiff. Like, you know about meme coins? And it's kind of like cool. You know what I mean? Like it's this new thing. There's market opportunities to be made there. And so to answer your question directly, NFTs are never going to officially die. But I think the days of like 150 ETH floor price on like some limited edition PFE collection, especially the ones that currently exist today, zero chance that happens again. And I think it's very wise for anyone that's still holding their beloved NFTs to maybe wake up a little bit and realize that there are a lot of new opportunities in the market. And it might not be such a bad thing to start taking some of that capital and rotating it into where the opportunities exist today. It's interesting because you've always got your finger on the pulse, Cooper. And like going back to the last two times we've talked about various subjects, I think you were the the one who put NFTs on our radar in the first place back in 2021. So with that in mind, like what is your take on just even some of the price action and, you know, quote unquote bull run? You know, a lot of people had their thoughts tied to this four-year cycle theory. And then we saw that prices increase. Obviously, Bitcoin ETF probably had a little bit to pay or play into that. But just in general, where do you see things are at? And this bull run, what do you think will be kind of the major theme? Could be completely wrong, but I'm still betting the farm on December 2025, top of the next bull market. I think that the next theme is going to be something very similar to what exists with these meme coins today. I'm not mm-hmm. going to say that meme coins are going to be the prevailing you know, meta of this next cycle. But if you look at the amount of energy and attention that something like Pump Fun has gotten, if you look at the caliber of people that are starting to launch Pump Fun tokens like Iggy Azalea, these other celebrities, that to me is the single most important thing worth paying attention to. So I take that with these sort of emerging social fi apps. So things like Friend Tech, for example, things like Farcaster, things like DGen. And I look for things that are sort of in the middle there. You know, something that's not quite immediate pump and super hard dump, but something that allows you to invest in creators, lets you invest in your friends. It's hard to pinpoint one exact thing, but I think what will manifest is NFTs were the category winner in 2021. And the type of NFTs that won was like the 10K PFP meta. And so if you start to think of it in a new way, I think it's like meme coins are the current category winner, but what exactly that like meta is, I think is still a little bit to be figured out. So Long story short, I think we still got another year and a half before we see the top of the next bull market. And so I kind of see this as an opportunity to really be taking bets and like kind of putting yourself in a position to win. Because I actually don't know if we've seen that like four to eight mint moment happen yet in the space. And I think there's going to be a lot more major wins and major upside opportunities to come in the next year and a half here. You said you're bullish on Solana. Why? Mm-hmm. Follow where people are going, man. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, it's like you look at the app store and you see Phantom being a top downloaded wallet. I talk to anyone who's new to crypto and their first entry to the space is trading meme coins on, you know, Jupiter and Phantom and all these Solana DEXs. And look, I'm just at a point where it doesn't matter what I think. People are just going to trade crypto however they want and just follow where the attention's going. You look at Twitter and you see the accounts that are doing really well these days and the accounts that are really growing. Those are traditionally, you know, people who are really into meme coins and people who are really into Solana. And so I think that from my perspective, I'm just going to go where people want to be. I think that from like a category perspective, I do think that Solana will outperform ETH this cycle. I still think that ETH is going to go up a lot. But one of the challenges that Ethereum has right now is that all these L2s have their own competing ecosystems that they're trying to vie for attention. And so with NFTs in 2021, All you have to do is buy ETH. You didn't have to bridge it anywhere. You didn't have to go to other chains or anything like that. Now with these L2s, Optimism has their own token. You know, all these super chain tokens have their own tokens. Arbitrum has their own token. And I think we're going to see a big rotation into like layer layer two tokens as a whole. But I think in a lot of ways, like I don't use ETH mainnet anymore. Like I don't know last time you guys have like made transactions on ETH mainnet, but it's just not as popular as it once was, I think the metas and the meme coin narratives are going to places like Solana and to base. And so I think that right now, Solana has a really good opportunity to just be 
the hot thing that like all the young kids are using that has like a very internet culture like appeal to it. And from my perspective, I'm like, look, you can choose to hate it because you don't like it or you can buy it because people are going to buy it too. So kind of answers my question on why I'm uh, bullish Solana and bullish base. In terms of just in general on-chain adoption, it seems like a lot of things are just coming to a good spot, right? Like L2 has made transactions so much cheaper, easier in many ways. You know, you've got better on-chain social experiences. All of these things seem to be aligning. What are your thoughts in general? You talked a little bit about, you know, price action for the bull run, but just in terms Mm -hmm. of adoption, do you think that this will be a significant bull run for adoption? I think it'll be a magnitude higher than what the last one was with NFTs, but I definitely don't think we're anywhere near like broad scale mainstream adoption. You know, I think that we're making progress. Like you said, the fees are lower. You can make a Coinbase smart wallet with just a face ID, but it doesn't change the fact that people need to be spending crypto. And it doesn't change the fact that they don't understand why they'd want to mint something. Or if you're not into speculating on meme coins, that there's really not a lot of compelling consumer products to use. So I do think that we're going to see a marginal increase in that. You know, what that looks like is probably a three to five to maybe 10x increase in the amount of people that were into NFTs before. And if you think about the peak of the last bull market, like, NFTs were everywhere. Like you could go, at least here in LA, I could go to any party or any room and people would be like, oh shit, like you're into crypto, you're into NFTs. Like that's dope. You know, like that's really cool. And then everyone's like, oh, you're into crypto, like you're in NFTs. Like (laughs) get away from me. I don't want to hear it over the span of like six months. So I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I think there's going to be a moment when crypto is very popular again at some point in the next year or two. But I think it's going to cool off again. And I think that we're still like a cycle away from there being like real, genuine mainstream adoption. And what that looks like to me is that people aren't coming into crypto just to try and make money. They're coming into crypto without knowing they're coming into crypto and they're doing it because all their friends are there and they actually want to be there spending time on these platforms too. You've given us a lot of hot takes this interview and I'm wondering if we could go even further kind of with the crystal ball gazing and let's say five years down the road, what's kind of a bold prediction that you have for the future of on-chain music? My bold prediction would be that you can buy $5 of your favorite artist very easily with a credit card. And all of those tokens are broadly adopted within the music industry as being valuable. You know, I think the North Star that I have is to be able to invest in your favorite artist and their success. I think that there is a lot that needs to happen in between now and then and a lot of cultural adoption that needs to happen in between now and then. Honestly, even as I say that out loud, five years feels like that's not even enough time. You know, just like the time it takes to really move like culturally relevant assets and move like culturally relevant ways of like distributing content and working with your fan base and whatnot. I think in five years from now, we'll have like a hundred artists that have launched like artist tokens in some way, shape or form, you know, maybe a handful of those that have done something crazy, but we're at least a decade out of there being like a crypto, like Spotify type beast in the market where like people are doing shit with music on chain on everyday basis. So if we can just get a fraction of the way there in this cycle, that's a win for me. Love it. As you know, we like to end every episode of Show Me the Crypto with the same three questions we ask every guest. You've gotten these three questions twice before. We're going to ask you them once again. Alf is going to ask you those questions. All right, Coop. I'm going to ask you these questions and then I will provide the previous answers. That's what I was going to ask. Let's see how much I missed it by. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) All right. So the first question, who's your favorite person to follow in the crypto space? Who did I say last time? The last? Okay, well, I got both. But you mm-hmm. want me to tell you, if I tell you first, that influences your answer. <laughs> I, have so. a, I have a new one. I know it's going to be different from my, yeah, my okay, last perfect. two. Okay, okay. Your, I'll, go, I'll start with the first appearance. First appearance was Naval, Ryan nice. Watkins, and Maddie Verse. Love that. Blogger. Yeah. Second appearance was Jack Butcher, Blockchain Brett, and Punk6529. Nice. Those are solid answers. <laughs> they were great answers. <laughs> I like that. So what's this one? I'm going a little bit more Farcaster native here. So Jesse Pollock, who I know is obviously active on Twitter as well. Uh, Ted, at Ted, and then at nonlinear.eth would be my follows for the cycle. Nice. I I you just got three. Yeah, do three every time. People struggle to do one often. It's like hard to Oh, I got to hit you with like 10 off the cover. (laughs) Nice. All right. Second question. What will the price of Bitcoin be 10 years from today? What did I say last? Probably said a million dollars last time. It's going to be my same answers. But the, this is the thing is like, we're now three years deeper. Oh, so yeah, like, yeah. that means you think it's going to stay at a million. 
for three years. I don't straight. know, bro. We get to a million dollar Bitcoin. We're all chilling. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's fair. Uh, you know, what, honestly, something... though, to be, I don't really think in terms of the price of Bitcoin though. That's like my honest reaction yeah, here. Is yeah, like no, I would say that if ETH is at a hundred thousand dollars in ten years, that would be more exciting to me. Or yeah. like if there's a net new asset that is able to get to like a top ten level of currency. Like my kind of reaction to that would be like, what is the market cap of base in like 10 years from now? You know, right. that's assuming base has a token. That's assuming that like this whole thing works out and whatnot. But I don't know. I think that the Bitcoin question is a really grounding one for sort of like a macro view of the space. But I haven't checked the price of Bitcoin in like years at this point. So I think it's kind of like a harder one for me to give like a very definitive answer on, you know? Yeah, I think it's funny, actually, just the question itself, because the answer 1 million is our most popular answer and albeit you know that changes when we're in a bull market or bear market it goes up and down but it's still the most popular answer by far and i've noticed that like you see headlines like, just around people people like to guess that mm. bitcoin is going to get to 1 million whether they, they're talking about five years or 10 years but it's always 1 million and the thing is time keeps moving so these <laughs> Other, like people have been saying that for at this point, like five plus years, people have been saying Bitcoin's going to yeah. be a million. Is at what point will it be like, hey, wasn't it supposed to be a million by now? You know, and they'll still if Bitcoin's still be not at a million dollars in 10 years from today, then we're all fucked. Yeah, that, <laughs> then it, it failed. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Third and final question What is the most underrated project in crypto? Underrated project in crypto. I'm biased because I just recorded a podcast with this guy, but uh, Hypersub would be my most underrated project in crypto. It's a That's company called Fabric, and they're basically building on-chain subscriptions. It's something that we use very actively for the record label. We have a Hypersub called Coop Records Club. And it's not that sexy. It's just like on-chain subscriptions. But what I'm really excited about is that you can give rewards to your subscribers. And so if they're subscribing to this show, if they're subscribing to our record label or to an artist or something like that, you can create these systems where every dollar you make on-chain goes back into a pool to be shared amongst your subscribers. And so in the same way that I communicated like, oh, you should be able to bet on your favorite artists and whatnot. I think that Hypersub is making that a reality today. They have a new version of their protocol launching on Friday. We're a huge advocate of it. So if you're listening to this and you're doing anything that could be turned into a subscription, Hypersub is your project and I'd highly recommend checking it out. Love that. Sounds Cooper, cool. we always love having you on the pod. We always learn so much in these conversations. Thank you for joining Alf and I on this episode of Show Me the Crypto. Thanks for letting me come and yap, guys. It's been an honor and a pleasure. We're three episodes deep. I'm looking forward to the next one. And 10 years from now, we'll come back on and celebrate that million dollar Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Show Me the Crypto. Please make sure to subscribe as well as rate and review this podcast.